The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, one announcement is a reminder. Um, there is a paper due on April 4th, and Michaela will be sending out a formal assignment uh, about that within a day or two, so you can get started on that whenever you like. Um, but, and we can talk about it more next week after the assignment comes out. But for the most part, what it's going to look like is um, uh, an assignment to, to to do a little more digging and some research and um, into uh, basically a, a people, place, or thing um, in the part of the history of MIT that we've covered so far. So take a particular person, maybe one of the signers of the charter or one of the early professors or an early student here, um, a place, one particular building from the period up to 1915 or so. Um, and we say thing, but I think that could be an instrument or a laboratory um, that is of interest and do a little profile of that about, uh, you know, what was it used for, what were people studying in the laboratory, how were people being taught, um, and basically to focus on the first, um, what is it, 65 years or so, 50 years or so, the 50th anniversary of MIT is 1911. So. Um, and something from that early period that interests you. There's a lot of material, um, both online, but also in the MIT archives, in the libraries. Um, actually, a really good source is just of the books that we've been assigning pieces of. You can just look further into those books, and uh, Michaela will help you with that, and, and actually probably have a little, maybe a session, special session on some of the research methods and what's expected for that. Um, so that's coming along. And uh, next week, we'll have Roz Williams in, um, who will talk about um, a combination of things. She's a historian of technology as well. She's written about uh, the history of MIT and the chemical engineering department, um, which happens to have been founded by her grandfather, who had a lot of interesting personalities on campus and things he was involved in. Today, we are lucky to have Ross Bassett with us, um, who's a colleague of ours from NC State. Um, has written a very good book on the history of CMOS technology and the, the creation of uh, semiconductor integrated circuits. Um, and now he's working on this book part of the assignment for which was the um, reading today on the Indian students at MIT. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. And um, over lunch, it was just becoming clear how many of the issues that were raised both in the readings and also in the response papers for today are, as some of you pointed out, relevant for issues on campus. We happen to be sitting two tables down from Tom Magnanti, who is the former dean of engineering here and the, the president of the new university in Singapore that MIT has founded basing on, based on the principle of organizing around design. And so, um, as many of you will have heard, from a variety of things, MIT's relationships with the rest of the world, its profile abroad is very much a topic of conversation at MIT these days, I'm sure. How many of you work in a lab that has some connection <coughs> to Singapore or some other international uh, research group? So a few of you do. Um, and how many of you were born and raised in the US versus uh, the uh, undergraduates very much uh, uh, more American-based. The, the undergraduate population is capped at about 8% international students, whereas the graduate student population is probably, I don't know the exact number, 50 or 60% international students. Um, and so, um, but even of the uh, U.S. born, um, U.S. raised undergraduate students, many come from families, first generation immigrants or whatnot. We've talked about that a little bit before. Um, so Ross will talk to us a little bit about um, Indian students at MIT. It's a very interesting case. There's a lot of interesting reasons to be interested in India and, and MIT's relationships there. But also, uh, not necessarily typical, but representative of MIT's relationships with 
Japan, China, Iran, Middle East, uh, lots of different places around the world. All of them are a little bit special, but there's sort of a longer, certainly part of a longer story here. Um, so he's going to talk for a little bit, put the, the article a little bit in the context of the larger project that he's working on, and then we can sort of pick up the discussion there. And I think that will naturally segue into also this particular period that we've come into, the turn of the century up through the beginning of World War II, the technology plan, relationships with industry. Again, so many of the issues from the reading that were on the table in 19. 15, 1930 are still issues that are on the table today in some form or another. So, Thanks, David and Rowan and Kayla. I, uh, I guess I think it's a good strategy to start out by sucking up to your audience, so let me um, do that. I uh, got my PhD from Princeton, and there's a professor there, Michael Gordon, who went to Harvard. And when he went to Harvard, he had a, a, a roommate at Harvard who was of Indian ancestry. And uh, Michael reported that this his roommate <coughs> Uh, told him how all his family back in India were all so proud that they had someone in their family who went to a school near MIT. Uh, and uh, it sort of gives you an idea, I think, of what, some, what the sense of MIT is uh, in India. And uh, so I've been to India a lot, and I, I've seen that firsthand. So um, just a, a couple of things just to kind of put this in context and why I'm interested in this. I'm interest, I've been in, interested in India for a long time, and I'm also interested in globalization. Of course, that's a, a big buzzword these days. Uh, but one of the ways I think about history and how we can find interesting history topics is sort of a thought experiment. So imagine, say, uh, what would surprise someone coming to the year 2011 from, say, 100 years ago? Say, uh, President McLaurin, you know, what would surprise them about, um, about the world today and if, if they saw it? And so I think about that, I guess, especially with regard, to, um, with regard to India. And let me just say some of the things that I think would be pretty surprising. And I guess anything involving Indians in the United States would be surprising because there were actually um, laws limiting uh, Indian Indians from uh, staying permanently in America. There were, it was very questionable whether an Indian, someone from India, could even become a citizen of the United States until 1920. Until 1965, the United States had laws which basically said, we really don't want Indians in the United States. There was an annual quota of 100 people. But let me just sort of tell you some things about the world of 2011 that is sort of surprising in that regard. Silicon Valley, the most, uh, my apologies, but you know the most dynamic technological area in the world. Uh, it's commonly said that Silicon Valley runs on ICs. And that doesn't mean integrated circuits. It means Indians and Chinese, <laughs> that um, people understand that Indian and Chinese entrepreneurs are some of the key figures who really start businesses successfully, help uh, move technology along. Um, I think of. Um, that school down the road uh, a bit, they just hired, uh, appointed a new dean of their business school. Uh, his, his name is uh, Nitin Noria, uh, an Indian uh, who uh, came, came to Harvard. Uh, MIT itself, uh, the former dean of engineering, uh, Subra Suresh, also uh, from India now. He's the head of the National Science Foundation, one of the leading uh, organization funders of science and technological research in the United States, setting you know, the agenda for scientific research. Uh, I think of, I don't know, do you know the building that's right across Vassar Street from the Stata Center, the uh, Institute for Brain Research, uh, that the, the train tracks go through the middle of, of it or whatever? Uh, that was designed by Charles Correa, an Indian, uh, someone who's the leading Indian architect. Uh, and so this was his first, he lives in India, this was his first commission ever outside of uh, uh, in the United States for an American client. And so uh, the point of this is that Indians play a very prominent role in technology in the United States today, which I think would have been very, very surprising to anyone 100 years ago. And then if we look at India itself, there are a number of things I think that are surprising as well. Uh, we're used to seeing you know, everything that we buy from Walmart or Target or whatever having a made in China uh, stamp on it. We don't really, uh, we can't really judge the provenance of software code or something like that, but if we could, we'd probably be surprised that 
how much software has, you know, would have the tag coded in India. And uh, I was in India in October and visited a, um, a place that, where they made transmission components for Fords and GMs in uh, a, a place in uh, Pune, India. Uh, another big Indian uh, company is set to, I think this year, start, uh, begin selling its model uh, SUV in the United States. So India is playing a, a remarkable technological role in the United States. Uh, even, you know, we might have considered that inconceivable 100 years ago or so. So that's um, what I've been interested in, in looking at. And so the way I uh, decided to do this was uh, I was trying to look for some way to understand the relationship between the United States and India. And the way I finally uh, decided to do it was that I found uh, that MIT has a series of uh, commencement programs that they publish with every commencement that lists every graduate. And they've listed the hometown of every graduate. And so they have these available for the whole 20th century. So what I did is I made a database. I went through these um, and pulled out every single Indian who graduated from MIT in the 20th century. And then, um, so I have this database and I kind of think of this as a filter that India is a country with a population now of a, you know, a billion people or so. Uh, you know, we can't look at all billion people. Uh, but so what I'm looking at is those in, Indians throughout the century who came to MIT. And so again, we can't look at every student at MIT from the 20th century, but we can look at, this is a s rather small group, it's about 1,500 people or so. And so to look at these students and say, you know, how did they end up getting from India 7,000 miles away to MIT? How did that happen? And then what happened to them afterwards? What, you know, what did they do? What, did they make any difference in India, uh, what were their careers like? And so that's what I've been doing. And so in the last uh, five years or so, I've been running around uh, India trying to track down Indian graduates of MIT, their, their family, and so on, just to find out um, some things about them. And so a couple of, of uh, just general themes that uh, come uh, up from this. Uh, one is, an idea of uh, technological nationalism, I would say, um, and, and then also the, um, the development of the information technology industry in India and globalization, and then also, um, I don't know if, you know, like in Star Trek they have uh, this tr tractor beam that sometimes will pull things uh, into the spaceship, that you could say MIT is a has been a tractor beam for global talent, that it's pulled international talent um, into the United States and uh, very often, uh, it's stayed in the United States after it's, uh, after it's gotten there. Uh, so uh, these are kind of some of the, the things that I'm um, touching on in, in what I'm doing. Um, and so uh, one of the, the, the things that you do see is uh, students who went to MIT in the 19, uh, early uh, 20th century, uh, very often, Going to MIT, you could say, was a nationalist act, that India was a British colony, and uh, most people, in some ways, the intuitive thing to do would be to make ties with uh, the British, British uh, society, with Britain. Uh, but so those who went to MIT were, in some ways, uh, doing something that was not very, uh, didn't make a lot of sense in some ways, having ties with, with uh, the British. And so that, that's a, a big theme that I've um, discovered. And um, one of the other aspects of this that has been kind of intriguing, uh, what do you think of when you think of Mahatma Gandhi? Like what sorts of things come to your mind? I mean, what sort of images, what, what kind of things do you, do you think of? Small peaceful man. Small peaceful man. <laughs> Any, anything else you think of with uh, Gandhi? He was fairly well to do and then he gave it all up. <coughs> and so his very wealthy lawyer gave, gave it all up. Spiritualism. Pardon? Spiritualism. Anyone else? So, I mean, we have those images of Gandhi. One of the uh, intriguing things about this research, when I, I sort of look at the Indians who went to MIT and the uh, 
1920s and 1930s and try to look at the networks of people they're involved in, where they come from. Um, one of the things that I find is if I try to identify where is sort of the heart of, of these people, what, what sort of, again, networks are they involved in, and, and so on, uh, if you look at a, a large number of them, you, you get connected back to Gandhi, that the large percentage of Indians were from uh, the part of India where Gandhi was from. A large number of them actually uh, had connections with Gandhi. One young man who uh, grew up in Gandhi's ashram uh, went, to, uh, went to MIT. And so uh, this has been kind of the intriguing thing. And it's uh, suggested some things to me. I've gone back and looked at Gandhi's papers. And one of the things that Gandhi has often been, you'd, I'd say, um, captured by political historians. Most people who are interested in him are people interested in political history, uh, Gandhi's spiritualism, his philosophy, his philosophy of nonviolence, and things like that. But Gandhi was very interested in technology himself, that he was, uh, we, maybe the most common image of him being involved, interested in technology, of course, is hand spinning. And it's easy to see that as sort of very, uh, regressive, you might say, very very archaic. But he was really uh, very interested in efficiency as he was interested in spinning. That if, if you were sub, a contemporary of Gandhi's and you told him you spun, he would ask you about your, uh, how, what your production rate was. And he was very concerned about you know, increasing production. His magazine had uh, statistics all the time about what uh, people's spinning production was and so on. And so it seems like uh, Gandhi had this, and almost, um, I think it's cut, this term has come across before in some of your other readings, he was almost um, Tayloristic in some of his ways, that he was very concerned about efficiency. He once wrote a, um, a, a piece in his newspaper, 20 rules that anyone who was going to meet him at the railroad station should follow. And he, he uh, was kind of upset in this that he said, um, a lot of people who met him at the train station would block his uh, path of going out of the train station. He said, normally it should take me five minutes, but now all these people are there. They're, it's taking me 30 minutes. I'm wasting all this time. And so he was very uh, frustrated with that. And so he, he was very interested in efficiency. And it seems uh, one of young man who grew up in Gandhi's ashram uh, basically said later on, I became an engineer at the hands of Gandhi. Gandhi made me an engineer. And it, again, it seems in some ways fairly uh, counterintuitive, but that, that was what he, he saw, uh, and that, that was uh, how he became uh, an engineer. And so many uh, of these people went to MIT as this act of technological nationalism. They saw that if India was going to be independent, an independent uh, country, they needed to have a technological uh, base. They needed to have technological capability so they wouldn't be relying on uh, you know, British people, Americans, that they could develop their own uh, technological infrastructure. And so that seems to have been a very big theme among um, Indians who went to MIT in the early part of the, the 20th century. I just I want to uh, just kind of flip through some of these. Sure, that'd be great. Um, this, um, this is uh, Alfred Marshall, the British economist, that uh, one a man uh, had studied at Cambridge, an Indi Indian man, and Alfred Marshall told him, uh, as I mentioned in the paper, that uh, Indians should, he thought Indians should not be studying going to Cambridge, but instead should be going to MIT. Uh, this is uh, um, Dave Chan Parekh, who I mentioned in the, uh, in the article. Uh, he started at Chemical Works in Western India. This is sort of a, you know, a, a drawing of the chemical works in the small town of Vartej in Kathiawar. If you can just flip through that. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Dave Chan Parekh. So here's uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and this is uh, Dave Chan Parekh. So uh, this is in 1915. Gandhi had just come back from, uh, from South Africa, and Dave Chan Parekh was this person who was very interested in uh, sending people to MIT, it sent a, lar a number of his family members to MIT. And this is a, a young man I mentioned in the, uh, in the paper again. He, uh, Gandhi was uh, present at his wedding, and then uh, the next year he went to MIT. 
and he, got, he was in the cooperative program in electrical engineering and he got a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and um, then returned to India. Um, and in India, he had this sort of double life, you could say. I would say that you, he was probably one of the best trained engineers in uh, electrical engineering in India, uh, having this master's degree in, uh, in electrical engineering. Uh, but he really didn't, he was kind of, if you were to look at his career from a purely technical standpoint, he kind of underutilized him, his, his, his education, that he was very much involved in the nationalist movement. He was uh, thrown into jail uh, for his participation in the uh, salt satyagraha. He uh, later led a large strike at one of India's leading steel plants and was thrown into jail for um, 18 months uh, after that. Uh, if you just hit the next slide. Uh, here's a picture of him at MIT again. He uh, apparently got training in you know, the, the military uh, uh, cadet uh, program. And uh, again, it was kind of intriguing to me. He, um, after he was in jail for 18 months, he still maintained very good relations with his former MIT professors, that he uh, kept in touch with them, exchanged letters. And so he didn't see some sort of dichotomy between his role as a uh, protester for freedom, as a Gandhian, and his, his career as an engineer uh, at MIT, or as an MIT trained engineer. Uh, this is the uh, Diwan, sort of the prime minister of a princely state of India in uh, Bhav Nagar uh, in western India. That, uh, this man was a uh, associate uh, of Gandhi and his, India had these princely states and he paid for a number of Indians to go to MIT. If you can, uh, and then this is a, a kind of intriguing uh, meeting in the late 1930s, the Diwan, Prabhashankar Putney is sitting down uh, there in the turban. He came to MIT and he hosted all the uh, Indian MIT students to uh, have lunch at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. And so here, here they all are. Uh, one of them was married to an American uh, woman, but so you see this sort of small collection of Indian students uh, there in, at MIT in the, around 1939. And then this is a young man, Bal Kalelkar. He was the young man who was raised in Gandhi's ashram. If you can just, uh, and then uh, he's, uh, here's Gandhi uh, right here. And then this is uh, Kalelkar right, uh, right behind him. And then if you can just hit the next slide. This is a letter that um, Kalelkar wrote. And Gandhi was a famous editor, that he was an editor of a newspaper. And Kalelkar wrote this letter to um, G.D. Birla, who was one of Indian's, India's richest businessmen. You might think of him as sort of an analog of Bill Gates at the time. And he wrote uh, Kalelkar wrote to G.D. Birla asking him to fund his education at MIT and Gandhi uh, edited the letter, sort of uh, helped him you know, make the right approach. Gandhi was a friend of this man and so he uh, sort of went through and made corrections and so on. Uh, this is uh, something that I found in, in India and uh, then just the, this is the next part of it. This is again Gandhi's um, uh, editing. He to tells Kalelkar, you know, incorporate these changes and uh, send it off. But so the point is, I think I would have thought the natural tendency of Gandhi would be to not be so enthusiastic about someone going to MIT. And he obviously could have uh, refused to you know, support him in seeking this funding. Uh, but Gandhi uh, in, supported him to get this funding. He, uh, once Gandhi had asked his friend to provide funding, once he had given him this letter, it would have been fairly hard for this person to, to resist. So that Gandhi was not, uh, did not see someone going to MIT as sort of a betrayal of his movement, as, as something it was, someone who was uh, turning his back on him, that he was uh, willing to support him. Uh, and this is um, uh, four Indians at MIT in about 1940, uh, having fun with, in the snow uh, and uh, having a, a snowball fight. There were, was a, a fairly rich social life among the Indians in the uh, 1920s and 1930s that were involved. There are uh, records of a number of pranks that they did on each other and, and so on. Um, after uh, one of them uh, completed his uh, uh, 
doctoral examination, he invited a number of friends out to a, a restaurant out in uh, west of, of Cambridge, and then he and his friend uh, snuck out and uh, drove back home and stiffed everyone else and left them uh, both rideless and having to pay the bill. And um, this sort of uh, caused a number of re repercussions uh, afterwards. Uh, this is um, a, a cartoon of uh, uh, Anant Pandya, who was uh, the first Indian to get a PhD uh, from MIT, and then he became uh, the first Indian principal of an engineering college in India. This was a college near Calcutta called the <coughs> Bengal Engineering College. And again, I, it's hard to imagine what this would have meant, that I think generally uh, the Brits had the general idea that they were uh, superior, that in some ways one of the aspects of colonialism was that the British, the Europeans were superior in technology, and that was in some ways the basis for colonialism, that once uh, people like Anant Pandya came out and were able to, uh, Pandya won this position as a principal of this college in an open competition with, uh, with Brits, and he then Brits then worked under him, it really made a statement that technology was not just something that was limited to uh, Europeans and Euro-Americans. Um, I mentioned in the paper again that uh, one of the key uh, moments before independence uh, in could talk about think about technological nationalism was that as India stood on the brink of independence, Indians began to say, we need something like an MIT for India. And um, so this uh, was the committee report that established the Indian Institutes of Technology, which were again uh, India's uh, institutes uh, analogous to MIT. Uh, two Indian MIT graduates sat on this committee and helped uh, establish this committee. Uh, this is again a picture of Anant Panja. He had a position as the head of the, the major Indian uh, aerospace uh, company and, and again was the first Indian uh, director of that. And then if you can, and then he died tragically in a car accident and then he was memorialized in a, uh, a magazine that was talking about his career and his uh, connection with MIT and this seems to have had a big effect on a number of people just Wanting that, making them want to become engineers and also making them want to, to go to, to MIT. Uh, I now, I uh, just want to say a little bit about uh, India and, and IT. Uh, one of the kind of interesting things I think about uh, globalization is um, I'd say globalization is in some ways based on uh, similarities and differences between countries. That if you think of sort of the, the boundary conditions, you know, if every country was exactly the same, there'd be no point in globalization because India would be just like the United States, there'd be no point in, in moving work or doing things uh, between countries. But if every country was diametrically opposed, if countries were diametrically opposed and had nothing in common, uh, then they couldn't, you know, relate, they couldn't communicate technologically, they couldn't have this technological uh, work done between them. And I guess what I'd say is that Indian graduates of MIT, especially in the 1950s and 60s and 1970s, were kind of the key people who connected the United States and India in a technological way. That they had this possibility of joining these two countries together. They had knowledge. They were often uh, very from upper class uh, parts of Indian society, had a lot of uh, knowledge of India, and then by virtue of their their education in the United States, they had a great knowledge of America and understanding of American technology. This is uh, the first Indian IT company. It was called uh, Tata Consultancy Services, and it was founded by uh, three MIT graduates. Uh, they were basically, you know, in their early 20s. Uh, Tata is a large Indian business company that has a number of uh, different business enterprises, and they said, we'd like you to start a computer business here. And it, they didn't really know what exactly they were going to do. They kind of thought it, of it almost like an Arthur D. Little, if you know what that is, a consulting firm. Uh, so they started this, and you can see it. Uh, and they kind of started it almost a, a, on an American model. Um, and it, it didn't work very well initially. If you can just hit the next slide. And, um, and then the next slide. This is their, uh, their operation in, uh, in Bombay. Um, again, they 
they thought of it almost like as a very academic oriented thing and it wasn't too much concerned with uh, profit making and finally the Tatas got a little bit frustrated with it and these three guys left and if you can hit the next slide, they ended up hire, um, hiring as the head of it another MIT graduate. Uh, this is a man by the name of F.C. Coley who sometimes uh, considered one of the key figures in the development of the information technology uh, industry in India. And what he had was he had studied at MIT. MIT. He had a lot of connections in it, the United States uh, by virtue of his time at MIT, but also he understood India and was able to really develop a successful business um, doing software work in India for American companies. And so that uh, stood him in very good stead and helped him become very successful. And one of the things I'd say about him is that when India started thinking about computer technology, a lot of Indians thought in terms of let's try to make our own computers, let's try to make our own computer uh, business, let's try to build all the hardware ourselves. And that was really, um, Coley didn't think that way. I think he understood what American industry was capable of and he knew they could, India could never compete with the United States in building computers. And it was a very capital intensive business that they would never have the volumes that America would have and so it was a losing game, losing proposition to try to think of doing something like that. And he had the idea of, let's just write software. Let's not try to do all the computing work. Let's do software. That's something where we have an advantage. Our costs, our labor costs are much less than American uh, costs. Uh, we can do that. And he had uh, connections in America. I think people in America were willing to trust him because of his uh, connections because of his MIT education and so he uh, got a lot of business uh, f for this company Tata Consultancy Service uh, by, um, from the United States. Uh, this is another uh, early IT information technology pioneer in India. His name is uh, Narendra Putney and again he did a great job of connecting India and the United States at a time when uh, there weren't a lot of connections. A lot of people in America didn't know that much about India. I could imagine, this is in the late 1960s, 1970s, that if you said, you know, I w I'm from India, I would like to do computer business for you, I think, you know, that's a pretty big stretch for a lot of people to, um, you know, what they knew about India, what sort of, um, what sort of confidence they have in, in Indians. But again, Putney uh, had, come to MIT, he had worked with Jay Forrester who was um, involved in a uh, uh, sort of as, as a great academic entrepreneur in, involved in a, in a lot of things and so he had the contacts uh, that really enabled um, India to get this um, sort of business. Uh, and just uh, I think I have one final slide. Uh, so you see Bill Gates on the, the left there and then uh, the person on the right is named uh, Narayana Murthy. And he's the founder of another big uh, Indian IT company called Infosys. And Narayana Murthy never went to MIT, but he was influenced by MIT in a lot of ways that he went to this Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. And there, his mentors were uh, Indians who had gone to MIT. Uh, then he, um, he went to another school, the Indian Institute of Management, where his mentor there was another man, Indian, who had uh, gone to MIT. Uh, then he worked for uh, Narendra Putney, the, the person that I had mentioned before. And um, sort of in a good, in a form that an, an American would appreciate, after he had worked with uh, Narendra Putney for a while, he got tired and quit and started his own business. Uh, and this became Infosys. But the point of this is, he never could have done that on his own, but after he had worked with all these Indians who had gone to MIT, who had a lot of connections to the United States, um, he had these connections himself and they really uh, helped him uh, to, uh, to develop those connections. Uh, one other point, I, I guess I, in some ways it's easy to see this as a great success story, the development of the Indian I IT industry. Uh, one other point, I feel like I kind of have to mention as well, uh, the greatest industrial accident in world history uh, was happened in India at uh, Bhopal in 1984. Union Carbide had a, a plant making methyl isocyanate and there was a leak at this plant and it killed 
Uh, we're still not exactly sure how many, maybe 10,000 people. Um, the manager of this plant uh, was also uh, an Indian graduate of MIT. And it, again, it's just the point of this is in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, where the United States and India were linked together in technology, um, generally speaking, you would often find an MIT graduate somewhere there. And so you see them in both, in both of these contexts. And so uh, finally, just you know, one other thing I just want to mention is then MIT, as I said, has become for 50 years or so a, uh, a tractor beam for a talent coming to the United States that Indians, uh, many Indians, uh, as they go to school uh, in the Indian Institutes of Technology, uh, want to pursue their education. And for them, they see the best possible place to go to uh, continue their education is MIT. Uh, you see it as a dream for them. Many of them, when they come to the United States, don't imagine that they're going to uh, stay in the United States, but often they end up staying in the United States. Sometimes their education, I'd say, f unfits them for work in India. Sometimes uh, they just get so caught up and see the opportunities in the United States. Um, but um, that seems to be a, a, a major trend. Uh, now there are some questions if it will continue that there are enough opportunities in India that maybe uh, Indians wouldn't feel such a strong need to come to the United States um, for graduate school. But so these are some of the, the basic themes and I, I want to, um, 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 most of it will be on the Indians who came, the people who came from India though. It, it wasn't until 1965 that there were uh, immigration laws that really let Indians come to the United States on any sort of a fair basis. So you see Indians um, who are Indian Americans or second generation uh, Indians, you only see them starting to come to MIT in any numbers in the 80s and then it kind of is, has ramped up as uh, more and more Indians are in, in the United States. So it's sort of a later part of, of, of the story. The most prestigious the two most prestigious fields you can go into are medicine or engineering. And, um, and in India, there's, I'd say, almost a, uh, an idea. You don't think of, like, what you want to do. You think of, you know, what you can do. You know, and you should, if you can get into an IIT, then you should do it, even if you were think nominally you don't have an interest in engineering, that you should just do it. But they're very, uh, I guess I would say, very focused on things that will earn you, make you a remunerative career. And there is a lot of skepticism, I would say, generally that liberal arts will make you a remunerative career. There, there are some good liberal arts schools, but there are relatively few people you know, go that route, that most people feel that in a country of a billion people that competition is just so fierce for jobs that everyone feels uh, the need to get into some area where, uh, where they're, pretty, they're sure that they'll have a, a good job. That I spoke to a professor at one of the Indian Institutes of Technologies whose daughter wanted to go into economics and he was kind of horrified that she wanted to do this and he wanted me to explain to him like what economics was, what kind of job she would get. And he, he was kind of half convinced afterwards. He said, well, okay, maybe I'll let her do economics, but I'm never going to let her do liberal arts. You know, that's, you know, that's sort of drawing the line that that's not, not going to happen. Um, and that, that's, there's a very strong feeling that way, um, that engineering, and even within engineering, there's a certain hierarchy. Uh, computer science is at the, the highest level. And so um, these Indian Institutes of Technology entrance to these schools is uh, determined by one exam called the joint entrance exam. You get a score on it and so there might be 100,000 or it might be 300,000 people who take this exam and you get a score, your score on it is a rank. So you, you know, you're ranked one to 300,000 say. And the person who scores one can uh, choose their seat in any major in any of these Indian Institutes of Technology. And then the person who gets the last seat is sort of forced to go wherever there's an open seat, wherever there's an open 
seat in a major. And so invariably, the number one student would take computer science, that that's just what, the, what they do. And then there's a hierarchy of computer science, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, I think mechanical engineering, civil engineering is uh, one of the lowest of the engineering. And then there's naval architecture, which is a bit lower than that um, too, so. They're all um, funded by the government, or are they privately funded? Yeah, so these are funded by the government, and uh, yeah, so they're, and the tuition is pretty, pretty low at the, yeah. And it's been kind of a political issue, issue in India um, that w one issue is um, how many seats should be reserved for people from what's called the scheduled castes or backward castes, so it would be a bit analogous to affirmative action, say, um, and so this has been very controversial, how many seats should be re reserved for them. Um, and then also, people in the middle class have been clamoring for access to these, that a lot of people have been shut out. There were originally um, five of these Indian Institutes of Technology, then there were seven, and now recently they've doubled that. Each one has sort of, uh, become the mentor to a new Indian Institute of Technology. And they've done this kind of for political reasons because there's such a great uh, demand and it's such a, uh, it's so many people want to enter to these, into these institutions and it's very controversial. A lot of people in, associated with the Indian Institutes of Technology think they'll never be able to maintain the same quality um, in doubling the institutions that they've had so far and so there's worry of uh, brand dilution, if you, you know, to use a business term of what that's going to do to these schools. More uh, stay in India now, and more of the leaders, I'd say, from now have been mostly educated in India than, say, in the 50s and 60s and so on. But the system is still at these IITs. They're very good undergraduate institutions. but uh, if you want to do serious graduate research, there's no question that they are not at all competitive with MIT. That, so there, there is this hierarchy that um, it turns out that at, at an IIT, if you go there, the best students are the undergraduates and then the graduates are usually actually worse students than the undergraduates. That they're students who are sort of percolating up from less prestigious institutions and as they go to graduate school they go to these IITs but the uh, people from the IITs who want to go to graduate school almost invariably go to the United States to go to graduate school. That they, there's a clear understanding of they don't have the research funding that American institutions have that would enable them to do the same kind of research that would be done in, in the United States. It, the system in both politics, I mean, you would, if you, in politics, I don't think you would ever go to an IIT because it's more about connections within, within India and it's more about being a political player in business. Um, I, it, the environment is so dynamic, I don't think you need to, to go, have gone to an IIT. There's many institutions where you can go to. Uh, the IIT is, the, you will clearly, can get into an American institution. I mean, IITs in some ways for a long time and maybe were paths to the United States to say, paths to American graduate schools. Uh, now they're paths to American graduate schools, but they're also paths to you know, Google in India or Microsoft in India or, um, or other multinational companies in India. So they're paths to those type, types of jobs uh, but if you wanted to be an entrepreneur or something, many of them come from some of the wide diversity of other schools in India. You can also, on that question, speak a little bit about one of the themes from your paper about different kinds of modernity. And it's interesting that we've talked a little bit about how in this country engineering is not as high social prestige as even to this day to some degree law, possibly medicine are. Um, and that, that the kind of modernism of this country 
coming out of the American Revolution had as much to do with both philosophy, legal philosophy, commerce, um, and that America was a, considered a very industrializing country in the 19th century, but it was still unprofessionalized. Whereas, as you see th through this period in the 20th century, where one of the big issues for a developing country like India is how modern is it? How is it going to catch up with the West? And through these kind of mechanisms, the whole idea of nationalism and building the country literally has this kind of engineering connotation and I think that sort of generated that level of prestige for I mean it's interesting that we heard it uh, I told an anecdote from Bob Siemens who was a MIT grad who came here in the about 1940 who was from an elite family and did his undergrad at Harvard and his parents said you know upper-class boys just don't go to MIT and here you have these students who are upper-class boys from India coming to MIT during the 30s when most of the other students would have been pretty middle class if not even still kind of blue collar mm -hmm. there's a, was did you see anything as far as difference in I mean they look very finely dressed in yeah. the photographs you mm -hmm. show and they would in some in addition to having not been American but yeah. they would also feel out of place in some way in that way yeah. during those years yeah so you um, do have very many wealthy business <coughs> Indian families sending kids to MIT that India has this system of uh, family businesses where the um, business is passed down from generation to generation and the next generation takes very active part in managing the business and very often um, these in the 50s and 60s what some of these business families would do would be to send the heir apparent to the business uh, to MIT to kind of prepare them so these people were uh, you know billion you know billionaires and so on and so you have uh, again these people who are really uh, you know, again, of the highest uh, social standing in India, coming to uh, to MIT uh, and um, and and um, and studying, yeah, really, in some ways, quite a bit differently than um, than American um, in American families. Other questions, comments. Question about the the five IITs that are founded in India, what late 50s, early 60s, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing was that each of them was sort of sponsored by a different country, mm -hmm. and th that raises a question with me about you know we talk about in this in this discussion about MIT being sort of the the focal point for many of the mo of the elite young people that were coming here, but given the fact that the Indian government in 1946 is proposing that you sample from around the world, uh, it's curious that the, the, I guess, the selections they made were so un-American in, in many ways, you know, and what, what was the reason, was it just that they wanted to see what was out there to, and then to draw on the best? Well, so it seems like part of it was maybe a strategy of the India had this policy of non-alignment that they weren't going to really say fly under the American flag or the Soviet flag. They were going to say we're not allied, that there's this Cold War, but we're going to chart our own path. But part of it was sort of using that to kind of uh, coerce countries to support them uh, a variety of countries to support them. So, you know, the United States, when they started this uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur, you know, the United States engineers, uh, MIT and a num nine other schools uh, supported it. And there was really the idea, we are going to make this the preeminent IIT that is going to be the best. And so there was this kind of competitive aspect. And I think the Indians purposely kind of promoted this to get all each of these countries to uh, you know, get them kind of to the table. The, the, for example, when the Brits supported their Indian Institute of Technology, they had the idea that if we can train Indian engineers according to our system, then maybe when they're out in companies, they'll buy British stuff, and that will help us. And so they had that idea, you know, that was part of what, why they were doing it. Again, so, you know, in the Soviets, I think, had you know the idea that this would be 
uh, a model that this would be a, a foot in the door into the um, a way for them to influence the development of, of technology. So each country, I think, had that idea, and India encouraged them to have that idea. Why not the French? Yeah. They, they're, they're left out, and yet the Grand Ecole yeah. are there. I, uh, yeah. So I guess it was whoever had, the, I think if you had the money and were willing to do it, so I think it must have been that they weren't willing to put up the, bu the bucks. To, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the British were always complaining that they didn't have the money to do anything on a scale that the United States did, and so I could imagine that the French uh, didn't either. And it was, I, I mentioned this in the article, there was a bit of an irony that the British were supporting the, an IIT because they, the British themselves admitted they had no MIT in, in Britain, so they were kind of trying to do in India what they hadn't done in England in a certain sense. 